Good morning, just about. Um, Brian and I will be giving you a, a very high level um, introduction to uh, reducing noise and vibration for high speed rail. So it's going to be quite high level compared with what Peter's just done. So if you really know about noise and vibration, I'm really sorry, this might be a bit basic. If you don't, hopefully it will give you a bit of an understanding of what, what the sort of uh, issues are and what's going on. So I'm going to start off by setting the scene in terms of the drivers for addressing noise and vibration, um, why we're looking at this. Then Brian's going to talk about airborne noise and vibration and groundborne noise and vibration, what the causes are, some of the mitigation. I'll close by a short summary on some of the challenges that we have in terms of noise and vibration for high-speed rail. So noise is an issue. People don't like it. Noise is unwanted sound, so if you're close to it, they don't like it. And with California high-speed rail project, it's one of the main concerns for the people there. The faster trains are going to create more noise. But it's not a new problem. It's as old as the Romans, where the chariots were banned from the streets at nights because they were making so much noise on the cobbles. It's detrimental. There's research that shows that it's detrimental to, to people, the, the noise. And data also shows that 65% of the people in the European common market um, are affected by transport-related noise issues. And with social media, the internet, um, the, the freedom of speech, we're a lot more vocal about the things that bother us now. So people are speaking up about these concerns. And there's a need to bring in uh, tighter measures for noise migration. It's things that have to be addressed. So it's very much out there in the public. So what's, uh, what's the drivers? It means we're going to be getting more rail uh, in places where people are going to get affected. One of them is growth. So the population is growing. The, the People on the left, one person represents a billion, and on the right, um, one person represents a sixth of the population. So in 1950, there was about 2.4 billion people. A third of them lived in cities. By 2016, that had grown to about 7.4 billion, with about a half living in cities. And that's projected to increase to about 9, 9.4 million in 2050, where we two thirds in cities. <coughs> Urbanisation is another driver, particularly for countries like Japan, which is very urbanised. And surprisingly for me, I think, um, some of the, the urbanisation is going to increase. <coughs> I guess living in the UK, where sometimes me being a bit of an outdoor person likes to get away from the city, but there is still a big growth for that. And in 2050, um, they're predicted that about 86%, um, there'll be 86% urbanisation in the developed countries, and over 60% in the developing countries. And the UN have also predicted of that population growth that we're looking at from 2016 to 2030, um, most of them are going to be sort of in the cities. So there's going to be a lot more people affected by um, the transportation. So another impact is environment, um, in particular carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and these figures that were produced show that transport is one of the, the bigger uh, areas of emission in the European Union. Um, they said it was about a quarter came from transport. And, the pie um, and just to note on that top graph, and it's only in fairly recent years that that transport emission is starting to, to decrease. Um, looking at the, the lower pie chart, rail is quite a small percentage of that, with uh, road transport being over 70%. So it's not just about, um, as it used to be, the rich people had cars. With the growth of um, interest in sustainability, there's a greater push towards having a uh, train. Enrique Penalosa is a former mayor of um, Bogota in Colombia. He's a, an urbanist, a renowned urbanist. He's quoted as saying, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich ride public transport. Anthony Albanese, he's the... Um, shadow transport minister in Australia, when he was talking about the high speed there, he said the passage of time is likely to make high speed rail more and more desirable, making it critical that politicians of today think ahead to tomorrow. So it is an important issue. So I'm just about to hand over to, to Brian, he'll talk a bit more about airborne noise and vibration. I just put this slide up just to show some of the figures um, indicating how high-speed rail has grown over, over the years. It's only a small prediction. I'm not sure what it's going to be long-term. Um, the measurement is 1,000 <coughs> kilometres. So I'll pass over to Brian. Mm. 
The first thing that we're going to consider is airborne noise, which is, surprising enough, noise that's transmitted directly through the air from the train to the receptor. Here we've got a couple of receptors, a house and a, a block of flats. You notice that the level of sound decays with distance. Partly it's geometrically because it's radiating outwards and partly it's being absorbed through the air. The sound is also, to some extent, can be reflected from hard surfaces. But in general, the sound is only going to affect any room within the building that is facing towards the railway. And quite often, new designs, the houses are built with the less noise sensitive build rooms on the railway side. So the kitchens and the bathrooms are there. The sitting rooms, living rooms, but bedrooms are away from the railway. The requirements for noise tend to be based on the, the existing noise level that's there. The requirement is that the trains are not to produce more noise than is there. It's measured in LAEQs, which are interesting things for those who know about them and, and not that important for those who don't. <coughs> Question is how, how much noise it is, how loud is a noise? The human ear can hear a range from, from absolute silence, well it is an absolute silence, up to, it gets very painful at 130, which is a equivalent to a jet aircraft taking off 100 metres away. The zero at the bottom is a, uh, said to be the sound level of mosquito at three metres. Uh, the 20 decibels is noise of rustling leaves, 40 is bird song, 60 is a normal conversation, 65 is an office environment, and generally a train at about 30 metres is said to be about 80 metres, 80 decibels. In turn, as we'll come on to later, that the ground-borne noise is generally set with a limit of, these days, about 35 decibels. So it, it's down at the very quiet end. <coughs> Where does the noise come from on the train? At low train speeds, most of the noise is coming from the traction, and some is coming from equipment such as air conditioning, compressors and such like. This noise increases with speed, but as you can see from the size of the graph, it's obviously not that exciting. On, at higher speeds, above, higher, above 30, about 30 kilometres per hour, the rolling noise <coughs> becomes more dominant. This is the noise created by the roughness of the wheels and the rails interacting together. By roughness, we're, we're talking about micrometres. It's not a significant level of roughness, and, unless you're having to go and grind it to smooth it down again. Above about 250 kilometres per hour, aerodynamic noise becomes significant. This is going to be generated by the airflow around the bogies, from the aerodynamic effects of the front of the train and gaps between the carriages, and also, in some cases, significantly from the pantograph. Some work has been done, no, it hasn't, not yet. <laughs> if we sum those together, we get the red line which shows the noise level increases and gets quite steep at the higher speeds. So as we get to high speed, we need to be more concerned with the noise generated by the train, and in particular, the aerodynamic noise. Some work done with arrays of microphones and data processing shows whereabouts on the train the noise comes from. And we can see from here that the dominant noise source is, is airflow near the bogies, the second most important one is at the pantograph level, and then there is some noise from the body of the train itself, the gaps between coaches and at the front. How do we mitigate this noise? The obvious thing is to put a noise barrier in the way. Given the, the rule of thumb that, that noise travels in a straight line, if the receptor can't see the train, then it can't hear it. It's not that simple. There is diffraction over the top of barriers and such like but it's, it's quite a good starting point for understanding what's going on. So in this case, the noise barrier is fine for the house. It's not too good for the block of flats, which still gets to hear the train. The noise barrier doesn't have to be a, a single vertical barrier. It can be uh, achieved by putting the train in a cutting, so the ground surface cuts it off, or 
almost equivalent to that building a noise berm where you, the, the ground is raised up to hide the train. This <coughs> looks more natural but will increase the land take for the railway. Examples of noise barriers. On the left, we've got a Docklands Light Railway, a low-level noise barrier. I think it's about 1.2 metres high, which is fine for cutting out the, the noise from the wheels. On the right is a higher barrier for higher speed trains. The problems, there are other problems with these barriers that they will impede access and safe evacuation of trains. And by the time you're trying to put a barrier more than four metres high to cut out pantograph noise, it's a large structure in its own right. Other things that can be done to cut down airborne, cut out airborne noise are rail dampers. This is fine where the noise is generated by the wheel and rail because it stops the rail itself transmitting the noise. But it's not a great, going to be a great use for high-speed trains. The second half of what we're looking at is ground-borne noise. This is noise generated by the wheels of the train running over the roughness of the track. This vibration is transmitted from the rail through the track, through the tunnel lining, the body of the tunnel, into the ground where it will radiate outwards to a building. The building itself <coughs> then vibrates, so the walls, the floors and the ceilings are vibrating, acting as loudspeakers, generating the noise throughout the whole building. This means it's not just the, the side of the building nearer the railway that is affected, but any part of it. Also, somewhat a lot more disturbing is the fact there's no visual indication of the train going past. The resident in the building only gets to hear the noise with no forewarning of it. What frequencies are we looking at? We've looked at the, the level of sound, but another important thing is the frequency of the sound. The human ear can hear sounds between about 20 and 200 and 20,000 hertz. Below that, the human ear can't pick it up, and above that, it's, it's too high to be picked up. As an indicator, the 40 hertz signal is the lowest note on a double bass. 500 hertz is a school descant recorder, or a 1 kilohertz is a soprano singing a high note. In terms of ground-borne noise, we're only looking at noise ranges between about 20 and 200 hertz because the ground will be damping out the noise as we'll come on to shortly. At the low frequency, the sound has a long wavelength. <coughs> At the higher frequency, it has a shorter wavelength. How does the ground damp out the higher frequencies? Well, if we take simple assumptions for the ground, my 200 hertz signal after about six cycles of vibration, the magnitude of it has dropped considerably. And at 200 hertz, the wavelength is such that the six cycles takes you to about 40 meters distance. If you put in a higher frequency or a lower frequency, the lower frequency has a longer wavelength, so to get your six cycles, you have to go a larger distance, more than 100 meters, whereas the high frequency has shorter wavelengths and is damped out over a shorter distance. We now come on to the one equation we've got in this talk. Sorry, Peter, not as good as you. The How can we attenuate the vibration passing through the track? As we can see, a mass spring system, such as a rail on an elastic pad, has a natural frequency of 1 on 2 pi times the square root of the stiffness divided by the mass. In the example we can look at initially, the, the mass is the mass of the rail and the stiffness is the stiffness of the rail pad. <coughs> and this graph then shows the ratio of the force that's passed through the system to the, to, to the excitation force, plotted <coughs> as a function of a ratio of the exciting frequency to the natural frequency. Now, as my grandchildren enjoyed recently, this is quite simply demonstrated. If I have my system, if I had excited at a low frequency, there is little amplification. So the displacement of my hand is very much the same as the displacement of the conker. If I excited at above the natural frequency, my hand moves a lot, but the conker hardly moves. 
if I get the frequency right, there's an amplification. This obviously works for a single degree of freedom model. If we put in more degrees of freedom, it gets more complicated. <laughs> It'll be left as an exercise for the student. What does our model look like in reality? Taking as an example a, a, a Delcor Alt 1 resilient rail seat, here the mass is the mass of the rail and the stiffness is the red rail pad underneath. And this one from the equation gives a natural frequency of about 90 hertz. If we look at a slightly different system, in this case a Sonneville block, the block is something like 100 kilograms. It has a considerably larger area of resilient pad underneath it. And that brings the frequency of this system in itself down to about 70 hertz. A high resilient Vanguard, a lot less stiff, brings the frequency down to 40 hertz. If we want to go lower than that, we go for a floating slab track where we have a large mass of concrete sitting on bearings, either rubber bearings, a rubber mat, or possibly steel springs if it's a GURB system. This will typically have frequencies between 10 and 20 hertz. It can go down to, I think they've achieved a 5 hertz system. Here we can see the effect of those masses and frequencies in terms of insertion gain, plotting the, ex the force coming out of the system as opposed to the force going into the system. You can see that at the natural frequency on the black line for the ALT1 system at 90 hertz, it amplifies the response. As we work down the left-hand side, get improving the dynamic behavior, we come down to a floating track slab there are two examples there, the pink and the red. One is a 17 hertz and one is a 12 hertz one, where they have amplification peaks at those frequencies, but they cut off the, they reduce the, the noise out above the sort of 30 hertz region. However, as again, life is never that simple. By the time we've included the interaction between the wheel and the rail, that they by putting more flexibility into the rail system, the wheel can't hit the rail so hard, so there's less force going in, including the effect of the unsprung mass of the wheel set, changes the frequency of what's there. <coughs> we can we move all the frequencies down a bit lower and introduce other frequencies, such that the, the blue line has a peak there at 200 hertz, where something's amplifying the behavior at that point we then get a different behaviour coming out from the simplification. And now hand you back to Julie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, so just to um, sum up with a, a very, again, a high level look at some of the challenges that we've got with respect to noise vibration for high speed rail. As um, Brian has discussed, in terms of ground borne noise, that's, a, that's the main thing that's happening. We're getting higher speeds and, and uh, it's going to be louder. So the, the wheel rail interface is, is happening, the, the noise is coming through the ground. We're going at a faster speed and there's going to be more noise. So we need to attenuate that with um, softer, um, softer uh, track slab. Another thing that changes is the excitation frequency. This is, so we've looked at here two speeds. We've looked at in the blue, 160 kilometers per hour, and in the, the purple, 350 kilometers per hour. So as the speed increases, these change. The coach lamp, for example, moves from two hertz to five hertz. That's not really a big deal in, in terms of what we're looking at. Below 20 hertz, it's not really audible. So it's not, we're not too concerned about it. The area we're particularly concerned about is the area that we've shaded. Below the 20 hertz, these are rough, rough estimates. Below that 20 hertz, it's not really audible. And above 200 hertz, the ground is doing most of the mitigation. But there are going to be, or there may be, aspects of the sources of noise that, that move into that zone that were previously not audible that become audible. <coughs> and there may even be things that were in that zone that um, move to a frequency where they, um, they get more mitigated by the ground. As well as that, there's um, things we need to be aware of within that zone of influence. 
So um, if we increase the speed and the excitation frequency increases, what we'll find is that, or what we may find, is that the excitation frequency gets very close to the amplification frequency of the track slab that's in place. So if we have a track slab system that was built for a certain speed, and then we put in uh, a faster train, we need to be checking that we're not <coughs> going to create a problem by it getting close to that amplification frequency. It may not be a big deal, but it's just something to be aware of. So that's all that I'm trying to identify at this stage. Another thing to mention, and Peter has covered this a lot more comprehensively and a lot more um, in depth, but just to mention that critical speed is something to be looked at. Um, with having, uh, needing to attenuate um, the track slab with faster speeds, we're looking at softer rail supports. And so there's a possibility that the, the critical speed may be of, of concern, and there's certainly people that have raised that concern in, um, if, if you look it up on the Google and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and it's something to look at. It may or may not be an issue. Poundrel um, looked at it on high speed one with the Vanguard system. They determined what it was, the critical speed, and they found it was significantly higher than the operating system. So in that case, they, they, were, they were comfortable. Another thing to be aware of with um, increasing speed is deflection. This is relevant in terms of ride comfort and safety. And as you can see from the extracts that have been taken from the BSEN, the bottom one shows that um, with increasing speed, the V value, um, there's a need to limit that deflection more, which means we might need stiffer rails or stiffer rail supports. The top is related to twist. Again, if you can see on the, the right-hand side, um, there's a smaller T, a T3, uh, linked to a higher speed. So that needs to be considered as well. So in terms of impact on mitigation and what we're looking at, as, as we've summed up, we've got a sound level that increases, excitation frequencies that change, a critical speed that may be significant needs to be looked at, and rail deflections may need to be reduced. So in terms of the mitigation that we're looking at, we're still looking at the moment, unless there's some new uh, whiz uh, solutions, we're still looking at the same sort of forms of mitigation, but what we need is more attenuation. So we're looking at the, the track slabs with the, the lower frequencies. Um, we're going to need, um, if we need to address the, stiff, uh, the, the deflection issue, we're going to need um, increased stiffness. Thinking back to Brian's spring, um, spring mass equation, um, if we're going to have increased stiffness, then that might mean increased mass. Um, there's concerns that with increased mass you need larger track slabs, which isn't necessarily what people want. Um, and another solution may be to have denser concrete. But that's, that's using it as the equations as they are, but that's in simplistic terms, um, which will narrow some of the ranges of mitigation that we have. So looking ahead, traditionally there's a, an FTA method that looks, um, looks at the source, the path, and the receiver. receiver. It's quite simplistic, it's very conservative. Um, so what we need to be doing and what we are doing on some of the projects already is moving to a more holistic approach. Um, so we need to be <coughs> looking at the, the solution as a whole, uh, which li links back to some of the, 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 the presentations we've had earlier. And if we can be working together with people that are thinking about the, the, the civil forms, we may be able to think about the depth of the tunnel, the form of the tunnel, and they, they can be brought into that mitigation. And also, let's be smarter with our calculations. Um, the, the FTA approach is quite simplistic. We can be sharper, more efficient, remove some of those um, conservatisms um, that are there. So just very simply and on a light note to, to conclude, um, we've had a number of challenges along the way. The history of railways is a history of speed. It started off in about 1803. The first loco, I think, went about eight kilometers per hour. By 1829, Stevenson introduced the rocket that went at 50 kilometers per hour, which was considered high speed at the time. And over the years, that's, that's increased again with electrification, with aerodynamic issues. So we've had a number of challenges along the way. We've now got new challenges, um, looking at acceptable levels of noise and vibration for high speed rail. We believe there are challenges that can be met and taken on board and will allow um, more advancement, um, which is always a good thing. So thank you very much.